Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this podcast. It's been a long time in the making. I hope it's therapeutic for some people, informative for others. Please subscribe to our page, the FAM Podcast page on YouTube, or subscribe to our podcast page on Instagram. Our username is FAM1M. I hope you get something out of this show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the FAM Podcast. My name is Tia, and I will be your host for this five-part mini-series. Now, FAM actually has a meaning. Yes, we will be interviewing families, but FAM stands for First and M Street. It's an intersection in Washington, D.C., off of New York Avenue, where my sister, Danielle Williams, was shot on September 13, 2017. She died the next day. This mini-series is dedicated to Danielle and all the families who are in similar situations. One of those families are here today. Mr. Clyde Boatwright of Baltimore, Maryland, will be telling us the story of his brother, Daniel Edward Leslie. But before we begin and get into the meat and potatoes of his case, Clyde, can you tell me a little bit about your city in Baltimore? Like, tell people what Baltimore means to you. Well, Baltimore is a great place. Um, you know, I've, I've had an opportunity to um, explore options to move to other places and, you know, I'll, you know, turn them all down because I love everything about Baltimore. I love, you know, the Orioles. I'm a big Ravens fan. As you can see, I've got my Orioles hat now, getting ready for opening day in two days. Um, but the city of Baltimore um, has given me um, a, a lot of hope, um, you know, because coming growing up in you know in, in a situation in West Baltimore where um, the school that you were a teacher at was the elementary school that I attended as a kid. I grew up exactly one street over from the location that um, that, that uh, school was um, housed in. And so you know that that community has some challenges, um, but that community has a lot of great people. Um, and so um, I, I think that what people need to know about Baltimore is that it's a great city. Um, it's, a, it's a city that um, has a lot of potential and, and has a lot of hope, um, but um, we do have some challenges. And and I think that, you know, it's more to life in Baltimore um, than just getting a, getting yourself a good crab cake. So how do you counter the narrative that Baltimore is a dangerous place and allow people to understand that it's a great place to live and visit? Well, um, it's, it's, you got to look at it from there's a totality of, of circumstances that are at play here um, to, to really know um, that crime is, is a target of people that are victims of the crime of crime are sometimes targets of opportunities. And so you don't judge a whole place or a whole town based off of individual situations. You have to look, you know, peel the onion back a little bit and, and look deeper into um, the issues that that plague our communities. Um, so I, I look at you know my brother's situation as as a, a situation that was unfortunate. Um, it rocked my family to the core, um, but I didn't uh, give up on on my city based off of his circumstances. I didn't give up on the youth of our city who needed who still need direction. Um, I still had to really really process. Um, you know, is it good for me to even stay? Is it good for my my daughter at the time to stay or my future son that I had, um, you know, years later, um, three years later, was it even good for him to even be raised in this city? So um, I didn't give up and, and I don't think anybody should give up based off of one scenario or one situation. However, you have to factor in that um, making the best decision for your family um, moving forward is is the most important thing. Um, but for me, I think that I just wanted to give it another shot. Around the time your brother was murdered, The Wire came out. 
and everybody was talking about body more murder land. And I never got that vibe. I mean, murders happen everywhere, but Baltimore is a beautiful city. Um, tell me what this podcast is doing for you and your family. In 18 years, or well, going on 18 years this year, 17 and a half years, I have not had an opportunity to speak freely about um, the situation in a, in a setting that will allow me to express the inner thoughts and, and feelings about the situation. So I think this will be, you know, pretty much therapy for me um, to get it out. I'm very surprised that you said that you were not able to speak freely. You are very active in the community and I know you're very vocal. So in 18 years, what stopped you from speaking freely? Well, I, I've spoken about this on a number of occasions with um, youth that I've been, you know, mentoring or coaching and, and things like that. I've spoken about some of the details, but to like to nail down and to get deep into the weeds about what happened, what happened with the investigation, um, what happened um, with the aftermath, what was I feeling? Um, what was my mom feeling? You know, how are we coping with it now? Um, I haven't gotten to a point where I'm, I'm able to express all of those things in one complete package. So it's always been splinter pieces or, or different um, portions of it, but it's never been that, you know, consistent flow of this is where I was when it happened. This is how I was notified. This is what happened next you know, and, and give like a chronological order on how things went down. So tell me a little bit more about Daniel, how he was growing up and who he was as a member of your family. Yeah, so my brother was born uh, April 23rd, 1982. Um, I, I recall um, when my mom was pregnant, uh, my mom we used to do like photo shoots, you know, with her sitting in the wicker chair and you know, I'm standing next to her in my little outfit and, you know, she had the umbrella. You could see her, you know, she was pregnant and we were excited um, uh, about uh, my little brother. Um, and so I recall coming from Matthew Henson Elementary School um, as a student. I, I remember walking home. Uh, I don't, of course, at the time, I didn't know the date because uh, I was five years old. But I remember walking home and there was like a baby bassinet and my mother was like, there's your little brother and he's here. And I remember looking in and, you know, just like admiring him as a, as a little kid and, you know, um, just having that relationship and that bond uh, with the five year gap. Um, you know, there was, you know, times when I became when I was 10 years old, he was five. So, you know, of course, you know, you hate your little brother, you know, from being a preteen. Um, going, uh, you know, up to adulthood, you just, because I was forced to kind of have him with me. Um, and, and that was one, as an older brother, you want to teach your little brother the tr all of the tricks of the trade because it, it gives you a sense of empowerment that you know something that someone else doesn't know. So I, I felt like as an older brother, I could teach him. I remember us like playing baseball and um, how I remember, I realized that he had talent in baseball um, and that was my big, big talent at the time. Baseball and basketball were the things that I excelled in. And I remember teaching him how to play baseball. And I had, as trying to teach him how to play baseball, my brother's naturally left-handed. And so I was teaching him how to hit a baseball from the right side. And so, um, and, and this is, you know, a crazy scenario. Um, when he went to play Little League, the coach was like, well, you throw the ball with the left. Why are you hitting with the right, you know, right side? He was like, because that's the way my brother taught me. And so I remember um, I, he came home and was like, my coach said you taught me how to hit the ball wrong. I'm supposed to be hitting left-handed. So I said, all right, well, let's learn how to hit left-handed. And so we started working that. And at the time, we're talking Little League kid. He's playing Little League. I'm playing high school baseball. And so with me working with him, teaching them how to hit left-handed, I learned how to hit left-handed myself. So that helped me become better as, a, as an athlete. So um, so that was one of the things that um, that we did growing up. It was always good, good, old-fashioned sibling rivalry and, and you know, knock-down, drag-out fights. But I, I will say this, the older we got, the closer we got. Um, and that was uh, important to my mom um, because... You know, Baltimore had, like I said earlier, they had we have unique challenges in this city. Um, but the one thing 
that I can say is I'm probably one of, I'm part of the last generation of kids that had to play outside. There was no internet. Um, there was no uh, cell phones at the time, they, you know, outside, you were outside. You stayed outside until you couldn't stay outside no more. And, and that was a good, comfortable place for us because there was many families um, on the block with many kids and we all were around the same age, you know, give or take a, a five or six year gap you know, with my, my little brother having a group of uh, kids around his age, but they all hung with us, you know, that were five years older. Um, and we had some people that were older than us that we looked up to, but they started to go on and get jobs and, and you know, living, you know, the dream at themselves. So we became the older kids. So, so it's, it's interestingly enough. Um, um, <laughs> so he progressed through middle school, and uh, he wanted to go to Carver just like me. Um, so he got in, he got into Carver and his freshman year, because of the way our birthdays fall, his birthday's in April, mine's in October. So I graduated at 17. So, you know, like I, I'm technically five years old if you look at the dates, but you know, I'm more like four and, and some change years older. Um, so my first year, out of high school was his freshman year into high school. Um, so he would have been the class of 2000. So that would have made him uh, begin his uh, freshman year in September of 1995, when I just graduated in June. So I remember walking him up to school, his you know, first day of high school, and basically was like saying to people that I knew, like, hey man, look out for him. That's my little brother here. That's my little brother, you know. And having the adults and the, and the people in the school saying, look, man, you don't go to school here anymore. You got to get out. Get out, you know, get out of the building. I'm like, but I just want my little brother to be fine. And, you know, I actually walked away from money that day. I mean, uh, two months out of, I mean, two weeks out of high school, I was working as a barber in the community where I grew up. Um, and so I like literally didn't go into the barbershop late until late just to make sure that my brother got into Carver just to walk around um, and, and get to know people that knew me. So, um, but unfortunately uh, his stay at Carver was kind of short lived um, because, you know, my brother had a, um, as a young, young kid, he had the, the propensity to follow um, what was to me not popular. What do I mean by that? There were people in my circle um, and my community and my neighborhood that like to do things that were a little bit different than what most average teenagers would do. And my brother found that to be exciting. Um, so some of my friends um, participated in, in um, and I, as a young kid, we participated in things that you wouldn't want regular, you know, teenagers to be participating in. And my, my brother found some of that stuff glorious and, and wanted to idolize that kind of behavior. So Mr. Boatwright, you've been a bit vague. Are you okay with expressing what type of activities you're saying your brother got into? Is that something you would like to tell us um, for this podcast? Well, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm comfortable with, you know, like, so with me, I had a job. I had a, I had a, a newborn baby um, who was born in April of 1995 when I was a senior in high school at 17 years old. So I couldn't always participate. And not that I even wanted to, but I, I didn't participate in the illegal stuff. I had to work. I had to take care of a kid. Um, and, you know, I had to take care of myself. So, I, you know, again, I worked at, at the local barbershop. So everybody came in and I and got a haircut. So um, some of my friends didn't have jobs. Um, they decided to to work in the, in the street trade, you know, um, and that that became their thing for a little bit. So what made you hesitant to say that he was, doing some illegal stuff. Uh, were you being protective of his story? Do you think that that narrative somehow messed up with the investigation or have people to have a different perception of him and his case? No, um, I don't think it's it's like a protection or anything like that. Um, I think it's more or less um, because, you know, as the story progresses and when we get into the circumstances around his death, you will see that, you know, being a part of um, the local street um, 
beefs and things like that in, in the, as a result of whatever um, community and neighborhood relations, that is what contributed to his death. Um, being involved in the street life um, is, is what was the contributing factor. So um, so I don't I don't think I, I was coming from a police where I was like protecting his, you know, what he did or what he, because as a young teenager, he wasn't out there like that, but he was, he was intrigued by that. He was intrigued by that street life. And that was one of the conversations he and I always had is he sympathized with his friends because now if we, we fast forward to him not staying at the same high school, um, you know, he started to do little small stuff that, you know, that got him kicked out of school. Um, and he went to another local high school um, and got him kicked out of there too. Um, and so one of the conversations that we had, and I was like, you know, what are you doing, man? You messing up. You know, I didn't use those words. I, I used some other words. And I'm like, look, man, you messing up. And I was like, what, what is it that that is allowing you or forcing you to be called to the game? Like what? I said, look, we, you know, our mother cook every day. Like we got a roof over our heads. We not out, you know, our gas electric ain't getting cut off. We not out on the street. You know, my, my mom works, you know, you know, she works. She, she bring home a nice, you know, little salary and make sure that we have food to eat and we got video games. And, you know, why do you have to feel the need to be a part of the struggle? You know, some of your friends, unfortunately, their mother is strung out, you know, on drugs. Some of your friends, unfortunately, they don't have, a home cooked meal. They don't have a roof over their head. They get evicted on a regular basis. You know, thankfully, thank God, we haven't experienced any of that. So why? Mm -hmm. You know, he really didn't have an answer, like on why he felt as though he needed to be a part of that. You know, or or a part of that street life, or or have that that street credibility. Credibility. I ask you that because a lot of families I spoke to in the past, they'll say, "Well, if I told." anybody that he was in the game, if he was out here selling drugs or doing anything illegal, then they somehow justify why he was killed or why the police d didn't find a need to solve the case. So I definitely understand why some families would just feel like, let me keep the fact that he was in the game close to the chest because I don't want to somehow devalue his legacy based on other people's preconceived notions of people who do things like that. So I, I think it was important that um, that he not be written off as number 285. Yeah. So I think he was either number 284 or 285, um, a number of, of homicide for the year 2003. Um, you know, my brother was killed December 4th, 2003. Um, and I don't want to be in a position where or I wouldn't want his legacy to be tied to that number uh, because that number is, is tied to families. Um, you know, because we loved him uh, no less whether he was a murderer, murderer himself or whether he was a, a, a choir boy or a saint. Regardless of what that person was into, they were still a victim. And the families are still victims themselves and they're still survivors. Regardless of what type of illicit behavior the person was into. Um, a life is a life. So can you tell me about the events that led up to Daniel's death? All right, so leading up to it, um, so my favorite holiday and is, is Thanksgiving. Um, for many reasons, as a kid, that was one of the days that as a family, um, we would all get together and everybody, you know, all your aunts and uncles and cousins and every, you got to see everyone. So you know, hands down, Thanksgiving's always been my favorite holiday, uh, even more so than Christmas. Um, Thanksgiving's it for me. And so um, on Thanksgiving, um, that was our last conversation. Um, and and that was uh, the 27th of, uh, of November of uh, 2003. And we had a pretty much an argument to begin the conversation because he was just released from jail. And so um, in the two weeks before uh, his, his death, uh, out of nowhere, he gave me a call. He, you know, he called me um, from the jail. And 
it was like, a, you know, one of those collect calls. You have a collect call from so-and-so. And I'm like, well, who the hell is calling me from the jail? And then when I read his name, I was like, push one. And I was like, man, what the hell are you doing? You know, and he was like, hey, listen, I can't talk. This was not, this is how the conversation went. I can't talk. You got to get me out. And I was like, get you out. Get you out for what? What you locked up for? And he said, you know, the police put some pills on me. I said, come on, man. The police put pills on you. You either were selling dope or you wasn't. And I said, you know, I'm not coming to get you. I'm not. I told you the last time, if you go back to jail, I'm not bailing you out. He said, I just need $500 and get me out. And he was like, well, I, I need I need you. He said, I wouldn't have called you if I didn't need you. I need to get out of here. It's real important that I get out of here. And I said, ho, 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 time out. Are you okay? He said, no, nah, I'm not. I'm not okay. So I was like, okay. If there's somebody, if you're in, in trouble or something, you know, you I can get you, you know, make a try to make some phone calls to get you moved to another section. I can try to get a hold of a social worker to get you out of there. If you know, if you're in a situation where you think somebody's gonna attack you in the jail, you know, we can get you out of, you know, get you moved, but you got to answer for what you locked up for. And he was like, no, nah, it's not that. I'm good. I'm fine. I just need to get out of here. So I was like, all right, cool. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow. So I called my mother and told her, you know, that he was locked up. And she was like, for what? And I was like, he said something about some pills. She was like, some pills? And I was like, oh, 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 that's street slang. He allegedly had some, some drugs on him. Um, but, you know, he has to answer for that. And I was like, he just came home, you know, from whatever happened a couple of years ago. And now he's, you know, locked up for this. And uh, I was like, you know, how, how do you have a job? And then you out there, you know, getting caught with some pills. I was like, he should have been at work. And so um, he had a mentor, um, an older guy, older than, you know, me as well, uh, who reached out and called me and was like, hey, man, just wanted to let you know, because my brother had a street nickname. It was Vito. And uh, so he was like, yeah, I, I just talked to Vito. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get him out. Um, you know, are you okay with that? And I was like, no, you should let him sit. I was like, so maybe this will be his last time going to jail. He, you know, he, he'll decide that he won't, don't want to play those street games anymore. He was like, nah, man, I just don't want to see him sitting over there. And I was like, he fine. I said, it, it's a, it's a misdemeanor drug charge. I mean, it's a, it's a minor drug charge. He's fine. Ain't, you know, he'll be fine. And so he was like, ah, oh, I got you. I got you. Then, you know, so like a couple of days later, he called me and was like, you know, I'm out. I'm good. You know, where are we eating Thanksgiving at? And I was like, well, we going to my aunt's house. So I was like, all right. Okay, cool. So on Thanksgiving, uh, I talked to him and I was like, you know, are you ready? He was like, no, nah, man, I'm just going to lay low. Uh, I don't want to go, you know, I don't want to eat, you know, around a bunch of people. I just want to be in my, in my thoughts. So I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever. So the whole time I'm driving out to my aunt's house, we talking on the phone. And I remember getting to my aunt's house. She lived out in uh, Edgewood, Maryland, which is like Harford County. So it's like three or four count, three count counties away from the city of Baltimore. So it's like you leave from Baltimore City, go through Baltimore County, and then you go into Harford County, where she lived. Um, so I remember pulling up to our house and, you know, other relatives were there. And I remember going out in her patio and I was talking to him and we just had a good conversation. We laughed, we joked. And, you know, it was just like, he was like, man, you know what? Man, I should have I should have told you to pick me up so we could have gone out there. And I was like, see, you are acting all funny, talking about you want to sit in your thoughts by yourself. Yeah, so you supposed to be out here Thanksgiving. He was like, I know, I know, I know. So we had that that back and forth conversation. It was the best conversation we had in a long time. After we had that confrontational conversation um, with him about the drug charge. And um, I'll get into how all of this ties in as as this, you know, um, as the story goes on. So, um, so fast forward on uh, December 4th, um, I remember I was going to visit, uh, you know, one of my coworkers uh, to discuss something about work. And it was like seven o'clock at night. And I, when I left my house and as I was driving, I got to uh, a stoplight and I had my turn signal on. And I looked up and it just started to lightly snow. And it took me about 10 minutes to get there. So yeah, I'm looking at the snow and I, as soon as I turned, my car completely went blank. Like it was like, it was like something happened. I don't know. I don't know what happened, but the, the clock on the radio was stuck at 716. 
and I had no power to steer the car. So I called my friend who lived around the corner and I was like, hey man, you know, my friend George, I was like, George, I'm, you know, on my way over so-and-so house to talk about something from work. Um, can you help me? Because, you know, I know George was a mechanic. So George was like, um, all right, I'll be on my way. So he came literally five or six blocks away from his house. And I'm standing outside of the car at this point with this light snowfall. Um, and when George showed up, he said, oh yeah, we got to push this. Um, you need to get um, a serpentine belt. So some kind of belt that connects my uh, starter and alternator and engine and all of that, that belt had popped at 7, 16 p.m. Um, so I wound up um, getting to um, my, my friend's house. My friend gave me a, uh, you know, gave me a ride home, um, my coworker, because I wound up being stranded. It's, it's, it had started snowing, so I was like, I'll just go home in the morning. You know, coworkers like, all right, no problem. I'll give you a ride. So at about 5.30 in the morning, because I had to be to work at 7.30. Uh, so about 5.30 in the morning, my coworker, um, you know, drove me home. Um, I got to my house and I walked in, grabbed my uniform, was on, put it on the ironing board and I'm ironing. And I recall the house phone ringing. And I was like, damn, it's six o'clock in the morning. Who the hell calling this early? Mm -hmm. And it was my mother. And I'll never forget the words she said. She said, I just got a call. She said, I got a, I missed 12 calls last night and I listened to the voicemail. I just got a voicemail that said that Danny got shot nine times last night and he died. And I said, what? And she says, yes. And she's crying. She's like, uh, Uncle Tra said, okay. Calm down. Let me see what I can do. Let me find out. I said, we, we're we not going to accept this as fact. We're going to try to locate him. So I tried to call his phone. Couldn't get his phone. Um, so um, I called the homicide unit of Baltimore City Police. You know, as a police officer, you know uh, the number to the homicide unit. So I called and, um, and I said, hey, look, this is, you know, I'm, look, I'm a police officer, but I'm trying to get some information. My mom received a call that my brother was um, was killed last night. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to get some information, you know. And they was like, oh, you are a police officer. Well, what's your, you know, what's your, ad, you know, so it's a, it's a administrative number that, that's attached to everybody. So I gave them my identifier. Um, I gave him my identifier and my administrative number over the phone. And it was like, okay, hold on. And then, you know, what they did was, what I found out later is that they called my police department to verify that it was me. So they called and said, hey, we got some guy, you know, claimed to be Claude Bull, right, trying to get some information on the murder. He said that his unit number is this and his uh, administrative identifier is that. And they was like, yeah, that's his number, you know, that's, that's it. And they said his home number is this number and his cell phone number is that number. And so they was like, oh, he's calling from the home number. So they was like, yes, this is his address. So my police department gave him all of that information to verify that it was me on the other, other line. So I gave him my brother's name and date of birth. And, um, and they was like, okay, well, you know, we'll have somebody give you a call back. Um, but we only had one homicide last night and it was in the 1900 block of Duke. So I was like, that's where my brother, ha you know, would hang out. That's the neighborhood community that he, he, you know, he was living in and that's where he was hanging out at. So I was like, well, do we have some information on, you know, who's the detective? And he was like, sir, we'll have somebody call you back, whoever I talked to in a lot. So I was like, all right, cool. So then I didn't, I didn't call back um, to my job and called out, called out of work. And I started working the, you know, trying to get information. So um, I reached out to a couple of relatives, you know, I kind of told them what was happening. So my, one of my aunts was like, Hey, this will be, you know, the central location. Everybody just come here until we find out what's going on. Fine. So I called the mentor who I, I told you who bailed him out. I called him and was like, Hey, listen, um, you know, we get an information that something happened to Danny. He was like, yes. 
Yes, they, they called me too. They called me last night and, you know, I went down to the hospital, but they wouldn't let me see him. And I told him I was his brother. I was like, you know, at this point now I'm pissed. So I said, but you didn't call me. I said, I'm his, I'm his real brother. You went to the hospital and you didn't even call me. Oh, I didn't even think about it. I said, you know, excuse my language. I was like, what the hell, you know, what the, what the hell? I said some other words. The hell you mean you didn't even think about it? You went and, and said that you were me. He was like, I know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, whatever, whatever. He was like, well, you know, um, they wouldn't let me see him um, because I couldn't prove that I was family. And I said, okay, fine, no problem. So I said, all right, I'm gonna call down a medical exam. So I called the medical examiner's office and um, they was like, um, yeah, we have a, um, uh, we have somebody that um, we need to identify um, but because of the um, the snow, um, city services is shut down. So the way we identify people is through fingerprints. So I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, so it was like, we're waiting on the technician to come from out of town. So I, at this point, it's like 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. So, um, so I'm like, okay, cool. So I was like, well, that's next to Ken. I can identify him, you know. And they was like, okay, well, all right, just come on down. So... So I was like, all right, I'm going to go ahead down to identify. And um, I told my mother I was going to do it. Uh, and so I was like, all right, cool. So I called uh, his mentor was like, hey, I'm going out to the medical examiner to identify. So he's like, OK, all right, no problem. So I had to take, you know, drop my mother off at my aunt's house. Um, and then I went from from my aunt's house to the medical examiner. And when I pulled up, his mentor was sitting on the steps. And he's crying, like, uncontrollably. And he just, like, just, I get out, and he just, like, falls in my arm. Oh, it's him. How do you know that it's him? He said, they asked me, were you the, are you the brother? And I told him yes. And they went and let me identify. And here again, I'm like, again, he's overstepping his bounds, but now he's confirming. It's him, it's him. I saw him, I saw him. And I'm like, all right, man, come on, get in the car. You know, so. I'm thinking, like, how am I going to have this conversation with my mother? Now, let me take a pause here. I understand that in the Black community, we have extended family members that they're not kin, but we call them uncle, aunt, uh, mentor. They're just as much a part of the family. But when something like this go down, we need to leave it up to the biological family or the people who are, you know, written in the books as that person's family member. You don't have the right to somebody else's story. It's it's painful. I mean, you know, I, look, I I'm a I'm a Bible believing Christian and you know I I you know I moved on from it. Um and so uh I as as I'm leaving the medical examiner's office, um I get a phone call. And the phone call was Hey, um, Clyde, how are you? Um, this is uh, Detective Mike Hamill from the Homicide Unit, the Baltimore Police Department. Um, so I'm like, um, yes. He was like, so just letting you know where we are. Um, your brother um, may or may not be the victim of the incident from 1900 block of Duke last night. Um, we have not identified him yet because we have to go through fingerprinting to identify uh, him. Um, and if, you know, we have a conversation, uh, if, if we, if I give you a call back and, um, you know, say, I need to meet with you, then, you know, that will be confirmation that, you know, that's where we are. So I was like, okay, cool. So we go, we buy a bunch of food. We got family coming in now. We like in this holding pattern. And again, I told you this is around 11 in the morning. Um, so at this point I said, you know what, um, I got to go get the part for my car. So my friend George could could fix it. At this point, I'm driving my girlfriend's car. And so we have to go back to my co-worker's house where he could fix the car. And he fixes my car at that point. I drive, give my girlfriend her car back. And now I get into my car to go back to my aunt's house. Seven o'clock, almost 24 hours um, to the, the time of when my car um, had broke down. And I didn't know until I got the police report that my brother was actually shot and killed um, at around 7.15. So it was one minute, a one minute difference from when my clock was frozen 
and my car broke down to the time that the initial call, it's like 7.15, 7.16, when the initial call for the, um, for the shooting came in. I believe in signs. I'm a big believer in signs. And the situation with my sister, I also had a sign that we will talk about next episode. But I definitely would like to explore this more. How many people who had a tragic event happen in the life of a family member and at that very moment, their life was put on pause. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a reason why I had to focus on that clock at the time. Like that, that happened. It's, it's so weird. And um, so I get my car, I'm driving and I remember, damn, I got to get gas. I pull up to the gas station, I put the gas pump in and I'm waiting on the, the pump to finish. And my phone rings. I'm like, I don't, I don't know this number. And I'm like, Hello? And he was like, Clyde, how are you? I was like, how are you? It's like, Detective Hamill again, Baltimore City Homicide. I said, okay. He said, um, yeah, I, and this was his exact words. <laughs> it's all like fresh in my mind. He said, yeah, I think we need to have a conversation. And I was like, okay, is that conversation going to be um, face-to-face? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, if we're going to have a face-to-face conversation, do you want to come to me or I come to you? And he said, how many people do you have? And I said, I want to keep it small and condensed. And I want my mother, her sisters, and my uncle, the only people, um, you know, to be involved. So it would be a small group of maybe like seven of us. And he says, okay, you know where the office is, bring them down. I said, okay, cool. So we, uh, I go back. And I pull my mother aside. Everybody again is at my aunt's house. I pull my mother aside. I say, we got to go and have a conversation with the homicide detectives of the police department. They called me and um, we got to go. And she said, she looked me dead in the eyes and she said, okay. And uh, she said, I know he's gone. I know. I already know. And I said, okay, you just got to, this is a process that it's just you and I now, and we got to go through this together. And she said, I know. She was like, all right, let's go. And we got in the cars, we drove down, we parked. And I remember um, how this is really, really significant. And why partly, you know, one of the reasons that there was no news coverage at all about my brother's murder um, that I can recall. the, as soon as we walked into the headquarters building, we had to go to a um, private elevator to get upstairs. This is after hours. This is like nine, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night now at this point. And as soon as the elevator, uh, you know, we're standing waiting for the elevator, and all of a sudden, our armed SWAT team came around the corner with their weapons drawn. And it was like, excuse us, clear the hall. Excuse us, clear the hall. So we like back up against the wall. And this is at police headquarters. And then we saw like three guys in suits with, you know, like their hands on their guns coming through the hallway. And then we saw another three guys with their arms around the police commissioner at the time. And they just pushed right through. They just plowed right through the hallway. Excuse us, excuse us, excuse us. And we're like, well, damn, what the hell is that all about? I've never seen that. I'm like, I've been a cop for three years at this point. I've never seen a SWAT team escorting the police commissioner. What the hell is going on? But okay. And um, and so the elevator, the, you know, the, there was a bing, the elevator, doors open. There was a gentleman that was standing right there, and he winded up, his name um, um is Antonio Williams. He was the colonel which was the the chief of the detective unit that was in charge of all the detectives in the homicide unit. And he looked at me, he said, "Um, yeah, uh, you guys are the family from 1900 Duke My condolences, he gave us all kinds of praise and love and offered his sincere condolences. It really, really seemed genuine. How that um, conversation stuck with me is because I remember him being sincere and, you know, Four years later, he became my chief of police at my department, or three years later. Um, And we talked about that conversation. He remembered that interaction because of that day. What happened was there was a federal prosecutor who was prosecuting the case. His name was Jonathan Luna. 
and Jonathan Luna was killed or found dead the same day my brother was killed in West Baltimore. So that's why there was the increased presence. I know about this story. I am a true crime person. Like, I love true crime. So I definitely heard about this prosecutor um, on some other podcasts I'm a fan of. And I can't believe that it was happened the same time and the same day that your brother was killed. It happened the exact same day. And the only reason we knew is because of the level of security that they had put on a police commissioner who we just by chance as a family was going to get, we were going to the death notification for my brother and we just happened to be in the same hallway and they had increased all of the security and protection on all the dignitaries based on this, whatever they knew about this prosecutor being and uh, being found, um, killed or, or um, at the time. So it was like the exact same day. And so the news dominated that like the news cycle dominated that case. And there was like no mention of, you know, my brother's murder um, on on Duclan and North. Do you have any resentment that they could find more information or have all this media coverage about this federal prosecutor and the, your brother's story wasn't covered? It was barely covered. No, okay. no, um, I don't. Uh, I, I, I look at it, you know, with me understanding how how the media works um, and looking back on that, it's a business and and the media sells papers and covering, you know, my brother's murder um, was not going to sell papers. They're in a business. And so people, they want ratings. So I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't begrudge the media for that um, because, you know, that it just, it just wasn't a juicy enough story for them. I'm so glad that you're here to be able to tell his story because when I researched this case um, in the newspaper and the on the internet, it was barely anything. I found something. It's like a brief synopsis in the bottom of the sun, but that's about it. So I'm glad you're here to talk about Daniel's case. So yeah, that story um, came out um, and I have that media clip. And uh, it gives, you know, it identified the 1800 block of Smallwood where, where my aunt lived at the time. That was his last known address. Um, and that was the house that we were all at. Um, and I remember um, not when I talk about like worrying about secondary attacks, what was this all over? I was really, really concerned um, back then because of the fact that um, his address was out there. So I didn't know what this was all about. Um, and so as the, as the story goes, it's funny, it, it leads right into this next part of the story. We go up the elevator, they take all of our ID cards, and then they go run like background checks to see if any of us are wanted and things like that. Um, and then they came in and they, you know, had a conversation, they identified them, you know, we assure you we're going to give give you every, you know, update that we can, this, that, and the third. And um as they were walking out, um, the detective says, the two detectives said, hey, you know, come back. Told me to come back. So I said, okay. And they said, look, we're going to get you some answers. You know, we don't have much, but we're going to get you some answers. So I was like, okay. And um, and they said that, um, which is, you know, part of which gives me a lot of comfort um, to know that they worked hard on this case. They was like, we have some information um, on the fact that we needed to talk to your brother regarding some other crimes. So I was like, some other crimes? He was like, yes, he was picked up by the drug unit uh, a week ago, and we were going to go talk to him. The police were going to go talk to him at the jail, but he bailed out before we got to talk to him. So in my mind, I pieced that all together. When he was telling me on the phone that he needed to get out of there, he knew something that he was involved in was coming down the pipe and they had him sitting at the jail waiting for them to come talk to him. And then maybe they would have charged him with a crime, which he wouldn't have got out of jail for. So that was like piecing that all together um, led me to believe that he knew that there was something that he was involved in that was coming down, down the pipe and he wanted to get out and run. Um, and so they would basically have to catch him again just to charge him. So. Um, so at this point now I'm pissed because um, I'm pissed because I'm like, well, what the hell was he involved in um, that 
you know, that led to somebody, you know, finding him and killing him, you know, and shooting him. So we go through, um, you know, planning the funeral and um, the next day, um, let me tell you how on edge I was. The next day, um, I had a Rottweiler puppy. She was a full dog at the time uh, named Donna. And Donna, you know, was a, a house dog. She stayed in the house, but uh, she was a she was a, a vicious Rottweiler if if given the commands to attack. Um, and I remember falling asleep and finally getting to sleep that night. And and I, I recall um, being uh, waking up to Domin like barking and shattering glass. Um, and I remember, you know, again. I'm thinking as what the hell was going on that we're now under attack at my house. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, I'm armed at this point. I go down the steps, my, my front window to my living room is completely blown out. Um, my dog is like barking at the front door and I see a sil silhouette on the porch. Um, I open the door and it was the newspaper man. And he's standing there with his hands up like, Oh my God, you know, and I, and I was like, who are you? And he was like, I'm the newspaper guy. He was like, I'm sorry, I didn't get out the car. I threw the newspaper and it broke your glass. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to break. But this is like six o'clock in the morning. My Baltimore Sun newspaper is coming and the guy breaks the glass the day after my brother was murdered. And here I am, I'm on edge thinking like, you know, this is like an attack. So I'm literally got the rock wall in one hand and something else in the other hand. Like, and the guy's like, you know, totally like just blown away, like, whoa, 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 you know, this was an honest mistake. So, so now I got to sit and deal with, you know, my, my bay window in my living room that was just shattered by the newspaper guy. So uh, we were all on edge. How long did that on edge feeling last for you? I know this is the day after the funeral, but how long since the 18 years have you been going through this on edge feeling? Um... Maybe up to and, in, and through the funeral. Um, because as I started communicating with the detectives, the uh, more information started to trickle out. And so um, as the information started to trickle out, I started saying, well, whoa, 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 this is a retaliation situation. Um, Whereas, you know, my, my brother is now dead as a result of something that he was involved in that was regarding someone else. And, you know, the person who, so it, it, the information, here's, here's how it goes. Um, there, was a, there was a situation where a young man uh, came to the neighborhood in the area where my brother lived. Um, and he brought a gun and was basically showing the gun off to everybody on the corner in the drug trade. And so one of the guys took the gun from him and was like, let me see it, shorty. And they looking at the gun. Um, this is a remote, but, you know, they looking at the gun like, let me see it, shorty. All right. So they mushed him and told him, man, get out of here, man. You're not getting this back. And he was like, y'all not taking my gun. I just got it. And he was like, man, get out of here. And he was like, all right, I'm coming back coming back, coming back. So he comes back, the young kid, you know, comes back with a, a firearm and he like shoots the whole corner up, like shoot it up bad. Like, you know, like it was bad. Like a couple people got shot um, and everybody knew it was him. Um, so um, there was a kid that um, in this new neighborhood, again, that we didn't grow up in, it was in a new neighborhood, as as I'm being as I'm recalling the story, um, that went to elementary and middle school with my brother, but he now lives in that neighborhood, and so he was one of the people that was shot. Uh, so my brother would go to the hospital to see him, um, and you know at some point he winded up you know having some major surgeries and things like that, and and I remember you know my brother telling me you know like yeah man he messed up. 
Uh, he don't look good. He might not make it, you know, this, that, and the third. And so at some point during all of that, there was a retaliatory shooting um, to include um, the person who shot up the corner, the little kid that had the gun. Or, I'm saying a little kid. I don't know. I don't know how old he is or whatever. But he and someone else were um, were shot, and I think they were killed in relation in, in, retali in retaliation for that one guy getting shot. So as a result of um, that retaliatory shooting um, from the first person being shot um, and the other two or three or whatever people that were shot in the second shooting, um, my brother's murder was as a, re a retaliation for that. Um, so in planning the, uh, the funeral, um, we had to take into account all of that because we didn't know um, how, you know, people were going to, you know, like, uh, are they not, are they finished? You know, do they, do they, are they going to come and, and to the viewing to, and things like that? So there were some, you know, people of interest that were, that the police department was looking for. And these people actually showed up to like the viewing, the public viewing. We did the family viewing and we left. Um, and as people of interest, um, showed up to the public viewing, um, the police department picked them up and took them in for questioning. Um, and it was some, you know, so, the, you know, I'm thinking like, okay, you know, I really, really thank these guys for really working this case because I guess whatever is going on back and forth, whatever between these two neighborhoods or whatever, they're trying to get to the bottom of it to prevent more bloodshed. Um, and so at this point, I'm sitting there like, you know, we, we get through the funeral, um, and, and as we are pulling up uh, to like the family house, um, you know, there was like, there was like, a, you know, some police officers that showed up and it was like, hey, man, like there's two guys sitting out in front of your aunt's house. Um, are they members of your family? He was like, no, we don't know them. They was literally like parked in front of the, the door. Um, and so I was like, we were kind of scared. Like, do we get out the car and, and have a, a situation right now? Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, that had that situation, you know, was addressed or whatever. Um, but, you know, they just happened to, you know, be some guys that just pulled over in that community or whatever. And they, you know, they were fine. I think my aunt wound up knowing those guys was like, oh, no, that's so and so and so and so. And we was like, OK, cool. So now we can get out of the family cars and, and things like that. And so. Um, so as time went on, you know, I would communicate with the uh, homicide detective like every few months. Um, and, you know, I would get that random call with CS number and be like, oh, here we go. Maybe we get an update. And so I remember one call in, in particular, he asked me, did I know somebody whose name I didn't know? I was like, I have no clue who that is. He was like, OK, well, we're trying to get a hold of him. So I'm like, I don't know who he is. And he says to me, he was like, he holds the key to all of this situation. So I was like, okay, all right, cool. I was like, so I'm gonna ask around. So I started poking around asking questions. So I went to the mentor and he was, oh yeah, I know so-and-so. So I was like, okay, you know him? I see you know how to get in contact with him. Yeah, 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 you know how to get to him. So he, I was like, well, where is he? He was like, well, actually he's here. I said, oh, he's at your house right now? It's like, yeah. So I was like, all right, cool. I, I want to talk to him. He was like, all right, cool. Uh, he was like, all right, I'll, I'll see if you want to talk. So I was like, all right, cool, no problem. I hung up the phone. I called the detective and was like, he's at so-and-so's house right now. Go get him. And they, they went right and picked him up. And this person had like some key answers to whatever they were trying, pieces of the puzzle they were trying to put together. So no answers. Um, a year goes by. No charges, no arrests, nothing. Two years go by, no charges, no arrests. The third year, um, we are, well, around two and a half years, somewhere around 2005. Um, and I need to back up in a minute, but around 2005, I get a random phone call again from the detective, like, hey, how you doing? And he says, hey, man, I just wanted to you know, let you know that I'm retiring next week. Um, and you know, this is my last case. He said, but I'm going to tell you where I am right now. Um, he said, we were able to identify the shooter, shooters of your brother, both shooters. 
So I was like, okay. And he was like, but here's the deal. They will never, there will never be a prosecution. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, one of the shooters was killed himself less than two weeks after uh, your brother's murder. So I was like, what? You know, like that was still like a back and forth. And it was like, well, we don't know if it was related or not, but he wound up being killed himself. So I'm like, okay. And he was like, well, the other guy, we got him on this major, major drug conspiracy charge. And if he pleads guilty to your brother's murder, then it will increase it to a federal racketeering or RICO case or something like that. They didn't have a murder to link to his drug organization. Um, even though they had information or evidence to show that he was a shooter, they still had no eyewitness accounts because the other shooter is dead and my brother's dead. So, you know, the only people that could have identified him. And I think it all relates to or goes back to a car stop that happened at the same time, because around the corner from where my brother was murdered, there was a there was a police car that had just pulled over a car, which winded up in a sense being the getaway car. Um, the car pulled up. Whoever the driver was was identified. Um, when the police also, you know, did the car stop or whatever, the two shooters were already out of the car. And when they, you know, shot my brother or whatever, um, and they started running, the officer went to the area where the gunshots came from. And they jumped in the getaway car and they sped off. It's it's amazing uh, that even today, um, that corner where um, my brother was murdered, there's a like one of those cameras, like cameras, right? So had that been there or operational um, at the time, they would have gotten some additional information. But um, you know, unfortunately, so they I, I was never able to a, able to get a name um, to even know who these guys were. Um, or to know what their involvement was. Um, so it's still listed as a cold, a cold case. So you're telling me that the police know exactly who killed your brother, but because of some legal formalities, uh, the case can't close. Have you or your family members gone to the police station or wherever they keep files to look at the files to actually figure out who killed your brother? I did. Um, so around 2009, um, I wanted to see um, what information they had. Um, and I, I started the inquiry, which triggered a, a call to my mother uh, from the detective. And the detective from the cold case squad called my mother and said, hold up you know, said my mother's name and was like, are you married to so-and-so? And and they said, yes. And so the detective was like, okay, I have to call you back. It was like, okay. So my stepfather's brother was assigned to cold case and he received my brother's murder as one of his case cases. And when he went to follow up, he saw the last name and was like, that person has the same last name as me, you know, and he like, had to make sure that, you know, it was the same person. And he realized that it would have been a conflict of interest for him to handle my, my, my brother's cold case. So he had to pass it off to another cold case detective. So, um, so we didn't get to a point where they ever identified um, the gentleman who went to jail. Uh, I, I think his plea deal um, was somewhere around 30 years for the, for the drug charge. Um, so for me, for me, I felt as though, um, if he got federal drug, uh, if he got federal time or so I knew federal time, he would have to take that to the door. So if he got 30 years, he got to do the 30 years. But if he got state time, I knew he would do half. And and I knew that 15 years is not enough for murder. However, I've seen worse in, in Baltimore City and, and, and I've seen people serve less time for murder. So in my mind, I just figured like. If he did do some jail time, you know, my 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 position was um, more of a a from a I guess from a spiritual standpoint, more of a 
uh, thinking of how how I, I will react as a Christian. So my thing is, I can't get revenge. I'm not seeking revenge. Um, and, you know, he has to take that up with his, you know, whoever he prays to um, and whoever his higher power is. He has to take that up with them. So see, that was the main question that I had for you and all of my listeners and just all of my guests. In a black community, we see a lot of families after um, murders, whether it's uh, murders in our communities, murders outside of our community, murders uh, with police officer involved, whatever. Whenever our people are killed, many families will go on to the Internet or the TV and say, I forgive you. Turn yourself in. Or I forgive you because I'm a Christian. And it could be the day or two days afterwards. How do you perceive that? Like, could you forgive somebody that quickly? Is that just somebody, something a devout <laughs> Christian would do? Because I feel some type of way about that quick forgiveness. I believe that it allows people to continue to to harm our our families because we forgive so quickly. What are your thoughts? So it. <sighs> So I, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I had a person that was um, that was a friend of mine, and this story is not widely told, but I, you know we're being transparent. Um, in the middle of planning for my brother's funeral, um, the person came and was like, you know, came out of family house, was like, hey. How you doing? You know, I'm sorry. You know, I love Danny like a brother to me. And uh, he was like, I want to talk to you for a minute. He was like, hey, man, whenever you're ready to go, you know, just let me know. You know, we can go do this. And I was like, go do what? He was like, we can go ride. I said, go ride? Yeah, you know, we can go get some get back. I said, do you know what I do for a living? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I know what you do for a living. I said, so, oh, so you want me? to go and participate in the same foolishness that got my mother sitting in that living room crying and, and looking lost. You want me to do the same thing to another family? I said, that tells you how much of a friend you are to me, that you can't even respect this house to even say that I should engage in the same type of dumbass behavior that got us sitting here looking a fool now. I said, I would never want to see another mother go through what I'm watching my mother go through. And you want to go out there and perpetuate the same foolishness? I said, you're a fool. And he was like taken aback by that. Like, like I was wrong. There's a picture that my mom had taken of us. And, and people might think this is a little, you know, people, some of your viewers or someone that views this may think that, that it was wrong. Um, on, a, on my brother, the day of my brother's funeral. They, so we used to have this thing, this, this basketball tournament in Baltimore City, it was held at Walbrook High School, it was called the Function at the Junction. And so I was picked as one of the officers to work there and they would, you know, pay us a check. They would write you a check and, you know, you would, you know, get a 1099 for whatever. And so I was like, all right, one of the people that was going to work it. And, um, and I remember telling them, I'm going to come to work. I said, well, I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to give my brother a proper burial and, and funeral, but I'm not sitting around and I'm not sitting around moping and crying. Um, I can be productive and I can be back on the street trying to find a person that did this so they can go to jail. You know, and that was my mindset. I was driven like I want to get back out there because every day that I'm sitting here crying and, and upset about this, I'm the, the killer is roaming free. I need to get back. I need to get on the case. And so I said I, I said that to say this. There's a, a photo. Um where I had the option to not work. I had, I was off, I was off for that day. And when my brother's funeral was over, we were sitting around the house and everybody was, you know, was, was like crying and upset. And, and, you know, my mother and I, we didn't do all of that crying and hooping and hollering because we loved him while he was here. Um, you know, we loved him endlessly to the end while he was here. Um, so we didn't have to fall all, all, all over the place. and. And, you know, there was no stone unturned. Like he knew that we loved him and we, we, we cared about him, but, you know, he understood us. He, like he, in his mind, he knew who cared about him. And, and I recall um, 
I recall saying to myself that I'm better off serving my community to try to help the next family because this pain is an ugly feeling that nobody should ever feel. And I said that, like, you know what? I said, I looked over and I saw one of my aunts was just like, I don't know why. And I was like, I was like you know what? I'm getting, I'm getting out of here. Excuse me, I almost cussed again on your podcast. I said, I'm getting out of here. And, I, and my mother was like, what? And I was like, I gotta go. I can't sit around here with everybody all sad. I was like, he ain't lived his life that way. And I, you know, I'm not going, you know, let him die that way. And I was like, he wants us to push on. And, you know, he would think different than me if I went out there trying to find a person that did it. And I went upstairs completely and I, you know, don't want to be TMI. Every, every item that I had on, every item, I took off new socks, new undergarments, new everything. I took everything off, put it in a black trash bag, tied it up down to the winter coat that I had because it was December to the hat, outer hat that I had, brand new winter coat, new suit, all of that. I took all of it and I put it in that trash bag and I threw it in the dumpster. And I got dressed in my uniform and my mother said, she was like, you know, so, so two times in my in the history of my family, my brother's funeral, my aunt's wedding was the only two times that all of my mother's siblings were together, all seven of them at one time. And so they said, since all seven are there, they wanted to take a picture. So they took a picture and then my mother was like, hey, take a picture with me before you go to work. And there's a photo of me leaning over and you can see the pain in both of our faces. This is the same day of my brother's funeral. And I got my uniform on, my arm around my mother. And that photo is hanging up in her living room right now. And that's a day that we both captured to just remember um, that incident. It It remembers that day. It remembers, you know, it makes us remember that chapter in life. Um, it, it makes us remember um, why we do what we do, why we interact with community, why we interact with kids, why we interact with with trying to make sure that other people don't go through what we went through. And it, it's a reminder, it's a constant reminder of that day. And every time I go to my mom's house and I see that photo, I'm always taken back to that day. And you know what? I got information that day. When I went to work, at that basketball game, I got information because I asked, y'all know Vito? Oh yeah, you know, Vito was so-and-so, you know, Vito did this and you yeah. oh, y'all know Vito, okay. We didn't have the same last name. They didn't know who they were talking to. People were talking, got information that helped move the ball along. But had I stayed there and moped around, I, we probably wouldn't have got close to getting some sort of resolution. It's not the resolution that we wanted, but it's still, to this day, it's still listed as an unsolved murder. But, you know, somebody went to jail, and unfortunately, the other guy couldn't be prosecuted because he was killed himself. Now, since Daniel has passed, do you believe that your mother is overprotective of you since you are her last son? Yes. Now, even to this day now, yes. But my mother has been like that for both of us our whole lives. She's been, like, overprotective of us our whole lives. It's been, I guess, more so um, since that day. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I mean... And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you um, you try to balance um, not letting them worry about you, but also, um, you know, still being a, a man and doing your own thing. So we're winding down now. And I have one last question for you. At any point did you or anyone in your family seek professional advice uh, to help you cope with the loss of your brother? Yes. So, um, so my mom, um, found, uh, this, this, uh, grief thing, um, that was given by the, I guess by the, the funeral home, they offer like grief counseling. Um, and it was March's funeral home. Um, so we went uh, to the session and we wound up seeing some people that we knew, and it was a group of mothers that all lost their sons around the same time. Um, got to, you know, bond with them. And I would just go there and sit and be quiet the whole time. And everybody's telling their story, everybody's crying and all of that. But I would just go and sit and just be quiet. Like, you know, in my mind, I want to find these dudes. Like, I want to find them 
and I want to put cuffs on them and take them to jail. I want them to go to jail, you know, or if they want to fight, we can fight. Or if we want to, if they want to shoot, we can shoot, you know, but I just, I didn't want to go kill them. You know, that wasn't my mindset. I wanted to bring them to whatever justice they had coming for them. But I, I was sitting, be quiet, you know, and, and again, I, I wasn't on an offensive type deal. It was more to protect the mold that I, I, I was in the mindset that I'm not going to, put another family through that, what we went through, but they need, they need to be, you know, this is what I do for a living. I, this is what my life is. I, I bring bad guys before the people that make the decisions of whether or not they go to jail. So that's, that's what my mind was. And I was young. Maybe I was too much into the, to the profession at the time, but I was just like, yo, I want to do that. And so as we were going to counseling, I was sitting and be quiet. I was sitting and be quiet. And then my mother was like, you know, are you getting anything out of it? I said, no. And I said, because I don't, I don't really want to talk to anybody. I don't want to talk about it. And so what we did, and this is interesting, she said, well, how about we go take a class together? So I was like, okay. And so the class was cake making. So learning how to decorate cakes. We, we would go and you had to bake a cake and then go and sit for two hours and they teach you how to twirl a little thing to make the rose petals and how to use the icing and things like that. And so um, I found that class to be very, very therapeutic. And we got to do stuff together. And so that's what my mom and I would do. We would just do things together. Um, and that was our way of, of, of coping and therapy and things like that. Um, and I say that to say this because my, uh, my aunt, on my father's side, um, she actually works uh, for, um, so March's Funeral Home has a spinoff and it's called Roberta's House. And Roberta's House is named after, I think, the, the matriarch of the March family. And they do grief counseling for, um, for all of the youth and, and families and things like that. And a few years back, um, my aunt said, how about you come and tell your grief story to the, to the kids? And I was like, okay, cool. I went there. You know, I have a love for, for kids. You know, that's what I do. I work in an educational environment. And I remember going and telling the grief story to the kids. And it was such a huge hit that every time since then, I've, you know, and be, I've even done it during COVID. Every time they get a new class of kids, that are having uh, the grief challenges. I'm one of the people that tells my grief story and tell, talk about coping and talking about light being at the end of the tunnel and how to move through this with these groups of kids. So it's like every maybe four or five months, I get to talk to a new batch of kids. And it's funny that being in the mall, I even had, which is crazy, I had a young lady from my church who I would see on a regular basis from my church every Sunday when we had youth events and all of that, she was in the class for dealing with the loss of one of her relatives. And when she saw me, she was telling everybody, like, I know him, like he go to my church and so-and-so and so-and-so. And I was like, hey, how you doing? What are you doing in here? You know, you know, I was like, you know, let's talk, you know? So like, just, I would see these kids and they were like, I remember you, you, you talked to me about, this and I was in, the, you know, they went to class at Roberta House, Roberta's house, and things like that. And so I, that's what I still do uh, to this day. Uh, whenever they reach out, and, and it's a constant basis. Every few months, they call me and tell me, "Hey, we've got a class. They're coming in on like Tuesday or or whatever." And one of the things which was interesting, a lot of kids um, were really affected by the. Um, the, uh, the issues that went on in our community as it relates to police and community relations, as it relates to um, the Breonna Taylor, or the, uh, the, the George Floyd case. Um, and so I was able to, you know, have these same conversations with these same groups of kids about their questions because they had access to somebody that's in the law enforcement community that does the work um, that looks like them and somebody that they can meet on a level um, to where um, they, they got an understanding of, you know, from a professional standpoint on what uh, I was presenting. 
that sounds like some good work, Mr. Boatwright, um, in the name of your brother, that you, you're able to help young kids, even almost 20 years later, it's 18 years, and you're still helping the community in your brother's name. And that's, that's great. Um, I thank you for coming out to speak to me today. Before we close, I wanted to say that today while we're recording is March 31st and happy Cesar Chavez Day if you are in California. But also um, today is the anniversary of the shooting death of Nipsey Hussle. I uh, want him to rest in peace and stop the violence. And if you're hearing this on the day of our premiere, it's April 4th and it's also the shooting death of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, both. I believe both cases are solved. I know Dr. King's case is solved, but at the end of the day, nobody wants their family member to die and um, at the hands of anyone. And, and if that happens, everyone wants their case to be solved and justice to be served. So thank you for listening to Fam Podcast today. Uh, we hope you tune in for episode two, where we talk about Danielle Williams and her death in Washington, D.C. If you have any information on Daniel's case, please reach out to the Baltimore City Police Department. Thank you.